welcome to Tide to the Moon, a podcast contemplating through story and practice how we might live with deeper meaning, joy and reverence. My name is Kate Lawrence and I am your host and this is episode 10 and it's the full moon in July which my calendar tells me is a super duper full moon. That is the technical term that came up in my calendar. It's when the moon's going to be its closest point to the Earth in 2022, and it'll be shining brightly as the largest full moon of the year and responsible for extremely low and high tides in the ocean in the subsequent days that follow. And as it happens, I have had a big rethink about this secular Sabbath thing. The idea of setting Sunday aside as a day of rest and reverence uh, has kind of gone by the wayside. A few weeks ago, it all went to the moon in a handbasket. And I've now totally fallen off the wagon. And for a little while, I felt like a failure, like my son was right, it's just like my commitment to walk up Mount Macedon, it doesn't happen. What happened was, in the small experiment that I've been doing over the last few moons, some Sundays have felt like, oh, a glorious week's holiday and been totally joyful and thrilling in their indulgence. And others have felt like I was slowly sinking into a quagmire, becoming heavy and slow, and stupid, less and less motivated, less and less energised as the day went on, and yet not enjoying the slowness, but feeling fettered by it, almost sickened by it. Then a few Sundays ago, I drove to South Australia, and given we had to turn back after the first hour to come home and get a a crucial item, and then racing for nine hours to make sure we got the boat to Kangaroo Island that evening, it's little wonder that that Sunday didn't feel very sacred or relaxing. Then last week, the day after we drove back from South Australia, all I wanted to do was clean the windows and make the mouse and dog smells go away and generally nest. And so that's what I did. So it's clear to me I can't sustain Sundays as a do-nothing day. In the meantime, I've started listening to a beautiful book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, who's from the Potawatomi Indians from Northern America. She's also an Associate Professor of Environmental and Forest Biology at the State University of New York. And in this book, Kimura shares a practice of the Haudenosaunee Indians from the area where she lives called the Thanksgiving Address or Greetings from the Natural World. It's a long practice of giving thanks for a multitude of aspects of the natural world and inviting us to agree that we can become one in our thanks for these things. A subtle or not so subtle way of inviting us to see where commonality lies, to notice and name what we can agree on before we focus on our disagreements. She also talks of the practice as a way of filling us up which runs counter to the capitalist consumerist society that thrives on our feelings of emptiness or lack and need. This practice ensures that we see how very enriched we already are. Reading the book and hearing about this, it reminded me that words are ceremonies. And as my YouTube yoga person, Sarah Beth, says, your daily practice is your strongest practice. So this in turn reminded me of some words, work and practices I started years ago when my children were very small. I spent some time creating or adopting a series of word rituals for us to say, the start of the day, the end of the day, before we ate. The best and most lasting one was probably the one I said to the children before they went to bed, and I'd bet each one of them could recite these words now, many years after I stopped saying it. Here it is. Good night to your waking, hello to your sleeping. Thanks waking for wonder, thanks sleeping for dreaming. 
This earth's very special, this life's love and learning. Tonight your sleep comes in time with earth's turning. The next one they would remember are the words that we said before eating, which I learned when one of my children was at a Steiner kindergarten. It goes like this. We gather round this table where bodies are renewed, where hearts appease their hunger, for we feast on more than food. Having said this now for years, I actually don't like it anymore because there's no sense of gratitude or thanksgiving for the food. So I've written a new one. Here's the new one. For the plants I'm about to eat, I give thanks. For the animals sacrificed for me to eat, I give thanks. For the love freely given to me by Mother Earth in the foods and fluids that sustain my body, my heart, my mind, I receive this love and I give thanks. And to you who join me, in body or in spirit, I give thanks and eat with a joy-filled heart. So I read that, and when I say it at dinner, I don't get my phone out and read it, so it's a bit wobbly. Sometimes I forget it altogether, and sometimes I can not remember it fully. So as they say, it's a work in progress. My ratbag 17-year-old has joined me, bringing his very own grace to the table, which he reads off his phone. The last one sparking an absurd banter between us about God and hellfire. And I've begun a morning practice similar to the Haudenosaunee Thanksgiving address. I've tied it to my coffee drinking habit and I take myself with my coffee outside on the earth and speak. Not as a recitation, but as imagining. So it varies from morning to morning. Sometimes things get forgotten. Others times I add new things in. And at the end, as a sacrifice, and it is, I pour some of my coffee on the ground. So I recorded myself doing this Thanksgiving address on uh, a number of mornings, and here's one of those mornings in all its imperfection. Thanks for the earth beneath my feet. For the earth that supports me. For the earth, my mother. For the earth that gives everything to me that I need freely and with love. For I am loved by the earth and the universe. I give thanks for all the waters across all the world, the oceans and seas, the estuaries and bays, the rivers, the great rivers, the streams, the tiniest little rivulets, the waterfalls, the lakes, the dams, the water that flows in my veins and arteries and all through my body. Give thanks for the life giving that water is and can be. Give thanks to all the creatures that make water their home, that give water life, that keep water clean and moving and capable of sustaining life for the fishes and the whales and the dolphins and the great squid and the tiny little amoebas and the bacteria and the viruses. I give thanks. I give thanks to the plants, to all the plants that are food that sustain me, to potatoes which I adore, to corn and asparagus and mushrooms, tomatoes even, for all the amazing garlic and onion, all the amazing flavours and herbs and spices that come from plants. I give thanks, given to me freely by the earth with love. I give thanks for the medicinal plants, the pharmacopoeia of the natural world that are given by Mother Earth to heal me and all other creatures across the planet. 
And I give thanks, most wondrous thanks, to the trees, the majestic trees, the giants of the plant world, the trees that break the wind, that sway, that bring flowers, that grant shade and shelter, that provide wood that can be made into shelters and buildings and tables and chairs and wood panelling and all the ways we use wood paper. How would, how would I communicate without the paper of trees? And trees that shelter, that provide warmth with their, with their bodies to be burned. And trees that take in carbon and give off oxygen. They're amazing. I give thanks to the animals to my animal friends, my dogs, the cat, the goat and sheep who look at me and remind me that I have a responsibility, that I cannot just ignore their plight. To my chooks who give me eggs and then to the wild beasts that provide wonder and majesty and interest and that they're just extraordinary and all the beasts that ought to be wild, really, and to the domestic animals that are sacrificed that I may eat, I give thanks, special thanks, to the animals out there alive now that will be on my plate, I give thanks. And I give thanks to the four winds as the wind just picked up and gently played across my skin with very sharp coolness, but sweet for providing that contrast and the coolness of winter that allows me to retreat into myself and my home. I give thanks for the wind that moves the trees, that moves the pollen, that moves the insects, that shifts the leaves, that cleans the air, that provides energy that comes from all the four directions. I give thanks. I give thanks for the thunders for the drama of them, for the darkening sky and the rain and the wind and the lashing. And the lightning and the thunder. I give thanks. I give thanks for the starry, beautiful night sky, for the jewels of stars that allow me to track if I was smart enough or trained that provide mystery and just dreaming and shapes and patterns and that, yeah, show us another way. Endlessness, infinity, the opposite of this earth. And I give thanks to Grandmother Moon who hangs in the sky as the leader of all women everywhere and the marker of time. And to my father, son, my father, son, high up in the sky, always cycling through, providing the rhythm of day and night, allowing me to sleep, waking me up, providing light so I can see if I was stumbling around in the dark and the cold. I wouldn't even be alive, so thank you, father, son. And I give thanks to the teachers, the Haudenosaunee, and the woman who wrote the book Braiding Sweetgrass and the indigenous people of this land, I give thanks. I remember they walked this land and cared for this land since time immemorial. And I give thanks for their care and their guidance and their wisdom. For I know these words resonate with their beliefs, their views. I give thanks to the teachers and the ancestors, my ancestors and all the ancestors. And I give thanks to my children and the children's children and the children's children's children. And I give thanks to the spirit of all things, the spirit in this tree and the blades of grass being crushed by my feet, to the spirit in the air, to the spirit in the goat. All spirit everywhere, I give thanks.
last Sunday, I still allowed myself to do whatever I wanted to do with no to-do lists and definitely no computer. But I didn't restrict myself. If I felt like doing something that would ordinarily be on a to-do list, why not? It became a practice in allowing, in emergence, in, dare I say it, presence. And the day unfolded with loads of relaxing, listening to a wonderful audio book by Elizabeth Gaskell while I worked on a blanket I'm making for my son. Bit of cooking and joy of joy, some good solid gardening. And then I met up with a friend and then later I cooked a roast dinner. It was a kind of old-fashioned sort of day and very sacred for all that. Thanks for listening to Tide to the Moon. If you like this podcast, please rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you listen and tell other people about it. And you can also show your support by buying me a coffee via storyground.com.au. And if you've got any ideas, suggestions, requests, comments or feedback, I would love to hear from you. You can find the show notes and contact details at storyground.com.au. Theme for this podcast is by Danya from Audio Jungle. This podcast is a production of Storyground and me, Kate Lawrence, and is made on the traditional lands of the Gunung Willem Bullock at the foot of Mount Macedon, 65 kilometres northwest of Melbourne, Australia. Mm-hmm.